Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be doing a top 10 surprises list. And what I mean by that is these are the games that surprised me the most with how much I enjoyed them or did not enjoy them after I did get to play them. I have uh, some notion of how much I think I will enjoy most games when I sit down to play them. And these are the games that surprised me the most by being significantly different than my expectations. Now, there are positive and negative surprises in this list. They're kind of uh, mixed up overall, but I tried to rank them by just how big a surprise that actually was. Uh, now, before we go into that, I would like to uh, mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the Jongets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to mention that the only reason this video is being made is because of the direct support coming in through the Patreon campaign. Um, now, this was actually requested and voted on by the contributing producer level supporters of the channel, and that is why this video is being made. So with that in mind, if you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to patreon.com slash games to learn more. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to ask is that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. All right, let's now start talking about games, and we will begin with the 10th game on the list, and that one is Brass Lancashire. Now, Brass uh, Lancashire is a new version of a game called Brass, which came out, I think, in around 2007, and these are uh, designed by Martin Wallace. Um, now, the reason this was a big surprise to me is because up to this point, I had never really enjoyed a Martin Wallace game. Uh, I played Automobile Back in like 2010, it was like one of the first 10 modern board games that I got to learn, and it was an awful experience. I might actually like the game now, but I was just way too new into the hobby to actually enjoy that game. I don't remember any of my issues with it, but I do remember um, being in the middle of it thinking, wow, this is taking forever and I'm not having fun. Uh, so after that, I have played a few other Martin Wallace games that I can think of. Uh, one of them was a study in Emerald, which was a pretty big failure for us. And I guess Via Nebula was my favorite Martin Wallace game up until I got to actually play Brass, and I thought Via Nebula was fine, but it wasn't like my favorite game ever, and I did end up getting rid of it from my collection. Now, Brass is a game that I had heard about for a while. I first really fell into the hobby in like 2008, 2009, so Brass was a couple years old, and a lot of people had very high praise for it, but when I saw images of what the board looked like, and then especially after I played Automobile, I just had this bad um, uh, expectation of the game. I just didn't think it would be for me. Uh, so when I ended up being able to play Brass Lancashire, which is effectively the original Brass, just with a nicer artwork, I was blown away by how much I loved that game. Uh, I remember uh, I, uh, getting up from the table from the first time I played Brass and just being so excited. Like I was just talking so loud and so much. I had so many things to say. And for the following week, it was pretty much all I could think about was brass and wanting to play brass again. So this was a pretty big surprise for me considering I expected it to be just a dry Martin Wallace experience and probably just another game that I wanted to try so that I could say I had played brass and move on. I certainly didn't expect to love it and end up getting a copy in my collection and uh, play it a bunch. And that has all happened. Uh, so that is why brass is on the list. Uh, let's now move on to game number nine and that one is Keeper. Now, this one actually has a pretty similar story to Brass. Um, up until the point where I played Keeper, the only other key game that I had played was uh, Key to the City London. I think uh, I had played that about a year before. I played Keeper for the first time at Board Game Geek Con, and I played Key to the City London at the previous Board Game Geek Con. Now, when I played Key to the City London the first time, um, I had I didn't really have a lot of expectations, and I ended up really disliking it. Honestly, I considered putting it on this list for a negative surprise, but I don't think it matched up with some of these other ones. Um, but because of that, after that, I was like, well, maybe I'm just not into these key games because a lot of people had good things to say about Key to the City of London. Well, the next year, um, BGG Con rolled around and Paul Grogan offered to teach me Keeper. He seemed like he really liked it. And I said, you know what? I'll, I'll give this a shot. Sure. I didn't really know anything about the game except that it was a key series game. So I expected to hopefully not hate it. <laughs> and I remember after playing that one for the first time, I was just blown away. What an amazing game that one is. And I'm not going to go into the specifics of the mechanics in um, this top 10 list, but uh, I definitely was uh, blown away by the innovation that was in this game. It has this crazy folding, infinitely folding action selection board and some wonderful worker placement ideas with uh, a lot of interaction between players and quite a bit of engine building. Um, I enjoyed that one so much that I went out and bought the uh, fancy version of the game that have uh, little painted on silk screened meeples that you can play with, or I guess keeples, sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that game just really impressed me way more than I was expecting. And it's one that I don't really expect to uh, leave my collection. Um, and I went into it, you know, just hoping I wouldn't hate the experience. 
All right, let's now move on to game number eight, and that one is I My Favorite Things. Uh, now, this one I uh, was able to play for the first time at Essen, uh, oof, I think that was 2018. Yeah, uh, I was uh, hanging out with my friends uh, Elaine and Efka from No Pun Included. Um, we hang out <laughs> pretty much the entire time when we go to Essen, and they were super excited about this game called I My Favorite Things, um, but when they actually got a copy of it and, you know, showed it to me, I just did not get what the fuss was about. They opened it up and it had this little metal mailbox and it had all these little sleeves and I, they were just really into it. But for some reason, them being into it did not rub off on me. And I was just like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Have fun with your silly little box with, you know, that silly little uh, mailbox in the middle of it. Uh, but later on, at uh, that Essen, we ended up getting to play this one. They they tried to get all of us to play, and I was like, okay, sure. Um, what's this game actually about? And I found out that it was a trick-taking game about making um, essentially top five lists uh, on your friends. Uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics of it. I, I've done an impressions vlog that you can search Jungus Games, I My Favorite Things, and learn a lot more about it, or see other people's videos. But I was blown away at how much fun I had actually playing this one. Um, I went into it thinking it would just be a silly little party game uh, with maybe a neat little trick, but uh, we laughed the entire time. We had such a blast. Um, you know, it's such a ridiculous setting where you might play this trick-taking game where you put a card down that has a word on it, somebody else puts a card down that might have a drawing on it, somebody else puts a card down that has, you know, a completely different word, like, you know, I might put a, a card down that has a cat, then another card comes down with a little poop emoji, and someone else puts a card down that says, like, ice cream, and then, you actually resolve a trick with it. It's it's ridiculous that it works, and it totally does. And we've actually made a hybrid copy of this one amongst our friend group um, here in California, and we've played that one a few times too. So this game was a lot better than I was expecting, and to the point where we've actually can't come up with variants for this one. Um, in the, the box when you buy it, it plays up to, I think, six players, and we played a 10-player game of it by tweaking the rules a little bit, because it really doesn't matter if you win or lose in this game. Um, this game is all about the experience of playing it. It's all about the journey, not the destination with this one. And uh, yeah, it, it definitely surprised me. Uh, let's move on to game number seven, which is Mandala. And this one is yet another positive surprise. Now, this is a two-player only card game that came out a few months ago. And I remember seeing photos of this one online, and it's uh, it's got these square cards with some nice colorful mandala type art on it. And then you have this big cloth mat that you put in the middle of the table, and then you play these colored cards down, and everybody was raving about this game. Uh, now, oftentimes when a bunch of people rave about a game, that makes me interested in it as well, but I found myself feeling incredulous about it. I saw the photos, I, I learned a little bit about how it played, and I just thought, that doesn't seem very interesting to me. You're playing these cards down into different areas in front of you, and at a certain point, you score the cards, and you take the cards in front of you, and you get some points for it. It's two-player only, and it just seemed so simple, and it just I just didn't get it. Uh, well, fortunately for me, somebody put a mod for this one up on Tabletop Simulator, and because there was so much buzz around it, I figured I may as well give it a shot. I didn't think it would be terrible, but... I was pretty surprised <laughs> when I ended up actually playing it. I mean, this is the top 10 surprises list, so that shouldn't be surprising. <laughs> but anyway, this game is so tense and so tight with such an elegant, simple rule set um, that I my, my expectations were completely thrown out. I mean, I my, again, I, I expected it to be just kind of the simple whatever game I'd play once and then ha will have played it and then move on. But instead, I played it a bunch online. I ended up buying a copy, and I've now played it a couple times with Jessica here, and she really likes it as well. It has a great classic game vibe to it. And, you know, I feel like I probably should have had higher expectations going into this one because I have enjoyed a lot of um, uh, card games similar to this in the past. I think the fact that it was two-player only uh, definitely brought it down in my mind a little bit. Not that I'm against two-player only games at all. I think it's amazing that they exist, but I usually prefer to play games with more than two players. Um, two players is usually my, my least favorite player count overall because I like being able to talk with other people around the table when it's not actually your turn. And anyway, that's just a personal thing for me. So um, once I was able to actually play this one, I became very happy that I had. And now I'm super glad that I own a copy. And um, I think it's likely we're never going to get rid of this one. I'm glad that Jessica liked it because I played this one like seven or eight times now. Uh, and up until I finally taught Jessica, I had never lost. And now I have lost. In fact, I lost really badly the last time I played. But uh, I've still really enjoyed it. And it was definitely a surprise for me. Okay, let's now move on to game number six, and this one is Ecos, and this is the first negative surprise that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, now, this one came out, I think, about a year ago or so, and I was very uh, excited about this game. Uh, it had a lot of things going for it, a lot of things that I thought I was really going to like in the game. Uh, it has uh, this 
uh, system where you are pulling tokens out of a bag, and then those activate essentially everyone's stuff in front of them, so there's kind of a simultaneous nature to it. It seemed like it had engine building with the cards that you put in front of you that can then be activated by those stones, and then the actions that you are doing with the cards that are in front of you affect a communal landmass, where you're actually building that landmass out, and you're putting a bunch of animals on it, the animals are moving, and I just love the idea of a competitive experience with a communal area that is alive, and, and it's alive because of the mechanics of the game. You know, I did this because it got me points. I had selfish reasons for, you know, moving this uh, elephant over there or, you know, this cheetah over to the spot. I had selfish reasons for putting water over here and, you know, maybe even ripping this landmass apart. And because of my selfish little mechanical reasons to get victory points, the earth moves. Like, you have this amazing moving thing in front of you, and at least that's what I was expecting. Uh, now, I got a copy of this one. I actually did a full playthrough of this one on the channel if you'd like to learn more about it. And I played it several times. And I remember playing it the first time and, and really trying to convince myself that I liked it. I don't think I actually enjoyed that play, but I was expecting to like this game so much that um, that kind of overrode my actual opinion of it. So I played it again. And then I think I ended up playing this one three times. I can't be sure exactly. It was about three times. And I remember the final time I played it, I just kind of gave up on this pretense that I should love this game and realized that I really dislike this game in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, now, I'm pretty sure I went into all of those in an impressions vlog, so I'm not gonna, going to uh, go into detail about that here, but the, the promises of the game, of this living landmass, that kind of got there. Like, there was definitely a great amount of change that happened in the middle. That was probably my favorite part of the game, but there was a lot of other issues with the game that just did not click for me that, again, I'm not going to go into the details of, but it just... Sometimes you go into experience saying like, wow, A, B, and C, these all just really line up with what I like in a game, and then you actually play it, and it does not necessarily uh, meet your expectations, and unfortunately, that was Ecos for me, so I, I did end up getting rid of my copy of this one. Um, I know a big reason I was expecting to like this game as well is because it was designed by John D. Clare, who made Space Base, which I think is excellent, and I guess this just goes to show that um, just because you like one game from a designer does not mean you're going to like all of them. Uh, all right, let's now move on to game number five on the list, and that one is Concordia Venus. Now, I say Concordia Venus in particular because this is like the fourth expansion for Concordia, and I really liked Concordia. In fact, when this expansion came out, I think Concordia was probably one of my top 10 games, but for some reason, when I learned about this expansion, it just did not do anything for me. I heard that this was a team-based version of Concordia. Well, I've played Concordia a whole bunch at that point. I thought it was an excellent, fully competitive game. And I remember um, I was at Essen when this was released. Um, I stood in line at the booth uh, with Efka and Elaine because they really wanted to buy it. I got all the way up to the front, and I just decided not to spend my money. I just didn't get it. It seemed like it was a lot of money um, to just get an expansion for a game I already like. I'm usually not that high on expansions anyway, which is probably one of the main reasons why my expectations were pretty low for this. But anyway, I just moved on and didn't really worry about it. Well, <laughs> a few weeks later, I went to uh, Board Game GeekCon, and uh, a bunch of my friends were very interested in playing this one. So we got the copy out, uh, we learned the rules, and we sat down to play a full six-player game of Concordia Venus, which means three teams of two. And <laughs> I loved this game. It was long. It was like closing on three hours, and everyone around the table was experienced with Concordia. So it was a much longer game than Concordia normally is, but it was exceptional. I, I absolutely loved the experience. It was this amazing thing where you took a game I already loved that was already a top 10 game and just heightened it, just like completely leveled it up to the point where I can't remember if I made that my favorite game of the year or not, but it was certainly my favorite game or my second favorite game of the year. It was one of the best gaming experiences of the year, and I've played it many times since then. Um, Again, I'm not usually crazy about expansions because normally they just add bulk to a game and I oftentimes don't play a game after I get an expansion for it because, well, I have to read the rules to the game again to remember how that plays and then read the rules to the expansion and the expansion's all mixed in, but Concordia Venus is absolutely the exception. Um, again, I probably should have had higher expectations considering I loved the base game, but my preconceived notions about negativity towards expansions brought this one down and uh, left me so completely uh, surprised when I actually got to play this one. And everyone I played this with has also really liked it uh, to the point where it's essentially two different games. I mean, at, the, at its core, it is still Concordia, but they play so differently overall. And honestly, this experience has really highlighted to me just how much I actually like team-based games. Um, before this, it never really occurred to me, but that is one of the reasons I love Teach You so much, uh, because that is a team-based game. And as time has gone on, and as I've played more team-based games, 
the more I realize I just love that uh, way to play games. So uh, nowadays when I see that a game is team-based, I'm actually much more interested in trying it because of experiences like Concordia Venus that surprise me so much. All right, let's now talk about game number four, which is Terraforming Mars. Uh, now, when this game first came out, it was a phenomenon. Uh, it was like everyone was talking about this game. It, the people were talking about it before the game was published, and once the game was published, it was just like every single podcast, every single video, all anyone in the board game media sphere was doing was talking about Terraforming Mars, and I was not having it. I just did not buy into the hype at all. Um, it just seemed like it was being way overblown. Uh, it was published by Stronghold Games, and oftentimes there was very big claims about Stronghold Games and that didn't really meet reality from my experience. So I just didn't bother tracking down a copy, almost to spite the situation, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't want to play this game. I, it just Everyone was talking about how great it was. It, it could not be that good. I'm sure it was mediocre, or at least I was sure that it was completely mediocre and that everyone was just captivated by the hype cycle. Well, a few months later, like many months later, I was at Board Game Geek Con, which you're probably starting to hear a trend for. I try a lot of games that I'm not sure if I'm going to like at Board Game Geek Con, and so I've quite often been surprised at Board Game Geek Con. But I went to Board Game Geek Con, and I ended up uh, being invited to play a full five-player game of this with a bunch of other people that I know from Board Game Media, kind of in the, the Twitter sphere. And I said, sure, you know what? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. It's Board Game Geek Con. They're going to teach me this game. It's probably going to be totally mediocre, and that's just the way it's going to go. So, you know, the convention came. I did a bunch of stuff, played all my things, and then it was time to play Terraforming Mars. So I went over, sat down, and proceeded to be completely blown away by this game. Man, I, I was so ready to just dump all over it. I was so ready to have my expectations of it being overblown, and I was so unexpecting the idea that um, it, I could actually love the game. <laughs> I remember walking away from that five-player game and going back to my group of friends and just telling all of them. I was just like, holy cow, Terraforming Mars is really good. And I think many of them were like, yeah, that's what everyone's saying. And I was like, yeah, but everyone's saying it. So it can't be right. I guess sometimes that is actually the case. And there are uh, probably more games on this list, at least one anyway, when I glance down, that uh, is going to match up with this again. So I guess I, I fed into some anti-hype and it set myself up for being really, really surprised by this game. I've played Terraforming Mars a bunch since then. I got a couple of the expansions, um, although I think my favorite way to play this game is um, just the base game with the Prelude expansion and the corporate era stuff, like all the stuff from the base game plus the Prelude expansion. Um, the other ones don't really add stuff that I really like, and I think the core basis of this game is really brilliant. So this was a circumstance where everyone really should have been talking about how amazing the game is. In fact, I just played this one like three weeks ago for the first time in a, um, probably a year or two, and I was once again blown away at how incredible that game really is. Uh, and yeah, wow, that one really caught me by surprise. All right, let's jump into game number three, which is Indian Summer. Uh, now, this is a game that I picked up at um, Essen Spiel. I think this was 20... 18, 17? Ah, don't quote me on that. Either way, one of the two that I've gone to. And I was really expecting to love this game. <laughs> you could probably see where this one's going already. Uh, now, this is a gorgeous polyomino style game, and it was the uh, the sequel, essentially, to Cottage Garden, which to a certain extent was a sequel to Patchwork. All of these games were designed by Uwe Rosenberg, and I loved Patchwork, but that was a two-player only game. So when Cottage Garden came out, I was quite excited for it, and we did get to play a four-player game of it at Board Game Geek Con, and uh, it was fine. It didn't really blow me away. I, I was expecting to like a little bit more, but it was a bit of a letdown. So a year later, when Indian Summer came out, I was fully on board. It's like, okay, this is going to be similar-ish to uh, uh, to Cottage Garden because it's going to be polyomino puzzle building with multiple players, not just two players. And man, the artwork just gorgeous. I love the look of this game. Thematically, you're essentially putting out all of these tiles that have leaves on them, and then these adorable animals burst through the leaves on the forest floor. Like, how jolly and wonderful and joyful is that? Well, I hated this game. <laughs> what a surprise. Uh, I got a copy of it as a press copy uh, while I was at Essen, and we played it, I think, that night because I was so interested in trying this one out. Um, we popped all the pieces out of the cardboard and we sat down to play at the uh, uh, the restaurant kind of area down below at our uh, hotel. And it was an exceptionally dull experience. I remember I played it with, I believe, Eka and Elaine and somebody else. I can't remember exactly, but either way, we were all just looking at each other being like, is this it? This is 
is this, this is it. <laughs> and wow, I just, I walked away from it feeling like surely the game isn't that bad. Surely it was just a bad experience, maybe just bad lighting, bad setting. I don't know. So I decided to give this one another shot. I think I played this one two more times, maybe just one more time, and proceeded to loathe the game more and more every single time I played it. Now, I uh, did a review for this game. Uh, this was made back in the before times when I used to make reviews. So if you'd like to hear about me talk about the details of why I dislike this game so much, then just search for that one. It should be pretty easy to find. Um, but yeah, uh, my expectations were really off on this one, which is a shame because I love polyomino games and I just adore the artwork in this game. I so desperately wanted the game to be good. And I, to this day, I, I wish that it was. I ended up really liking Spring Meadow, which was the sequel to Indian Summer that came out the year after that one. Um, it's a really good game. I still have it in my collection, but the art in that game is effectively tiles with snow on them. I really wish I had uh, the game of uh, Spring Meadow with all of the Indian Summer art assets on it, but I don't think that's actually going to happen. But either way, this one was a very big surprise at, anyway, at least as far as how disappointed I was. So let's now move on to game number two, and this one is Gloomhaven. Now, I hinted before that there was another game kind of like Terraforming Mars on this list, and that one was Gloomhaven. Now, I remember uh, when this one first went up onto Kickstarter the very first time, uh, I was uh, a subscriber to uh, the Rado Run Through uh, YouTube channel. I still am, but <laughs> I was way back then as well. And I remember seeing this pop up in the feed and I clicked on it knowing nothing about the game. And uh, I remember watching most of the, the run through video and thinking, there's no way this game works. <laughs> like it just, it was this dungeon crawl with all these cars and all these fiddly bits. And it just, it looked like a train wreck. I, that, that was my honest interpretation of it. I remember glancing at the Kickstarter page and thinking, you know, just, just another Kickstarter, you know, just promising all this stuff with all this stuff. And it's just, it's, it's going to be a train wreck. It's not just not going to work. So I didn't think about it anymore from that point on, but then when the game actually shipped, uh, one of my friends did back it on Kickstarter, and um, they asked me if I wanted to play it with them the very first time they sat to, uh, sat down to play it. Um, they actually lived next door to me at the time, so it was very easy for me to say yes, and so I just decided to go over there and see what the train wreck was like. <laughs> well, I was not expecting to fall in love with the game completely after even just that one play. I remember being halfway through that play thinking, how could I have been so wrong? <laughs> uh, you know, my all my expectations based off of what I saw in that first Kickstarter. I think the issue is that so many Kickstarter campaigns promise the world and under deliver. Uh, Gloomhaven promised the world and delivered the world and the moon and maybe a couple other planets as well. Um, just it's, it's something that does not happen that often uh, where everything comes together so well with such brilliant mechanics and an incredible, ridiculous amount of content in that first box. It's just... A very surprising thing. Uh, it skyrocketed up the, uh, the Board Game Geek rankings, um, you know, all the way up to the top. Um, I'm not sure if it's still number one. I think it might be. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it skyrocketed up to the top of my rankings as well. I wouldn't say it's my favorite game at this point, but it's certainly a top 10 game. Uh, I've played uh, the copy that I ended up getting uh, well over 30 times. Realistically, my only issue with Gloomhaven is that I'm never going to finish it because it was too long. I wish it had been split up into like multiple chapters or something like that, so I could have completed a story bit thematically and then moved on to the next one, but our playgroup um, just couldn't really last the entire length of this campaign. Uh, so mechanically, this one was an exceptional experience. I, I loved playing it 30 plus times with my friends coming over to our house, and I think it's just an amazing overall system. I have a copy of uh, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which is that smaller experience, which is probably going to be my, my actual favorite Gloomhaven, but I'm not sure if I actually have plans to play that one, but I have a copy, so hopefully at some point I do, uh, because it seems like it's all that good stuff in the box without the box having so much stuff that I never actually complete the campaign. Uh, but either way, Gloomhaven absolutely surprised me. Um, it's It was a bunch of promises that actually came together uh, in a very rare way. So we've now reached game number one on the list, and that one is Alien Artifacts. Now, this game, <laughs> I had very high expectations for. And the reason for that is because at Board Game Geek Con, which again, I've said so many times, um, many years ago, I don't even remember how many years ago, it was the year before uh, Alien Artifacts was released. So about 11 months before it was released, um, I actually got to play a prototype of Alien Artifacts. I played it with the Portal Games guys, and um, I enjoyed playing it, uh, this prototype with them so much, I asked them if I could borrow it and I took it over to the other side of the convention and uh, taught this one to my group of friends and played that with them, and they all loved it as well. It was such a elegant, cool system to get this kind of very light 4 x vibe in a card game, and I just had 
so much fun playing the prototype. I took it back to them and I told them it was exceptional and I could not wait to play the final version. Well, about 10 or 11 months or whatever uh, later, the final version came out and a copy of it got shipped over to me and we hated it. <laughs> it, it just did not work. It was such an incredible experience because I had played it before. I played a prototype and thought it was an amazing backbone to a game. I thought it was such a great start and I couldn't wait to see where it would end up going. What I didn't expect to happen was that they would actually layer so much stuff on top of this elegant backbone that it just completely broke apart from all of these different things that just did not work together. It was just way too many things crammed into a pot, shuffled around, and it just did not work um, to the point where um, in, uh, I think, yeah, that, that one game I played with all my friends here and I ended up playing another game at Essen, I think later on that year, just to to make sure I wasn't crazy. But when I played it here with my friends, uh, one of my friends got up from the table when we were about three quarters of the way done with the game and said, I am not gonna play this game anymore. It is making me so angry. <laughs> I cannot play it anymore. And this person was there with me at BGGCon and played the prototype and loved the prototype just like I did. So he also was just incredibly surprised. I guess all of us were who got to play the prototype and enjoyed it so much. So that is why Alien Artifacts is at the top of the list because I had the um, <laughs> the extra ability to, to try that prototype and already know that I, I really loved the game or at least I loved where I thought the game was going to go. And then I ended up playing the published version and realized at some point between the prototype and the final version, a serious course correction had happened in the uh, overall design process. And it was a game that I, I really disliked and so did my friends. So unfortunately, uh, my biggest surprise game overall is on the negative, but uh, I think there's pretty good reasons for that. So uh, that has brought us to the end of this list. Uh, this was an interesting one to put together, uh, definitely thinking outside the box from a lot of other lists because I was trying to rank them by just how surprised I was. And there were certainly some games that just barely missed the list as well. Um, I know that uh, The Boldest was one, uh, Lowlands was another one that I considered. Um, there's a lot of games out there and it's really easy to be surprised even though there's so much information. You can watch videos about a game, you can read uh, up on them. I didn't mention this in the Mandala bit, but even after I read the rules to Mandala, I was not at all convinced it was gonna be anything special. Uh, so oftentimes you just have to sit down and play the game to see if the magic works. Like all these abstract ideas and little colorful pieces of cardboard and plastic, do they actually turn into the magical experience of a good game. And, you know, sometimes you expect it to and it just completely falls flat and you're effectively looking at a bunch of inert pieces on the table. And sometimes it comes together in this amazing experience where you have this alive uh, uh, thing in front of you that might have you uh, nonstop thinking about it for weeks later. And um, that's both of these things have obviously happened numerous times over the years. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed me kind of going through some of these stories for what I think are the top 10 biggest surprise games that I have. So uh, yeah, that's gonna bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.